ओम ज्ञान तिरंधस्य ज्ञानांजन शलाकाया चक्षुरोन्मल तस्म श्री गुरव नम नमा ओम विष्णु पदा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो टुडे मॉर्निंग वी कंटिन्यूइंग द डिस्कशन ऑन द फिफ्थ कैंटो द सेक्शन ऑफ द कॉस्मोलॉजी वेयर द भागवतम इज इन वन सेंस रिवीलिंग द ओवरऑल द भागवतम मूड इज बीइंग रिवील्ड ओवर हियर because what we will see is that while the bhagavatam is speaking about even the cosmos its focus is not primarily the cosmos its focus is let's see we'll discuss on 27 to 29 so shukadev goswami continued my dear king how shall i glorify the character of bali maharaj the supreme personality of godhead the master of the three worlds Hmm. who is most compassionate to his own devotee stands with club in hand at bali maharaj's door when ravan the powerful demon came to gain victory over bali maharaj vaman dev kicked him a distance of 8000 miles with his big toe i shall explain the character and activities of bali maharaj later in the 10th 8th canto of shrimad bhagavatam so beneath the planet known as sutala is another planet called taladala which is ruled by the danava demon named maya maya is known as the acharya master of all the mayavis who can invoke the powers of sorcery for the benefit of the three worlds lord shiva who is known as tripurari once set fire to the three kingdoms of maya but later sorry it's not maya it's maya throughout maya dano but later being pleased with him he returned his kingdom since that time maya dano has been protected by lord shiva and therefore he falsely thinks that he did not fear the sudarshan chakra of the supreme personality of godhead then we have text 29 so the planetary system below talatal is known as mahatal it is the abode of many hooded snakes descendants of kadru who are always very angry the great snakes who are prominent are kohaka takshaka kaliya and sushena The snakes in Mahatala are always disturbed by fear of Garuda, the carrier of Lord Vishnu. But although they are full of anxiety, some of them nevertheless sport with their wives, children, friends, and relatives. Purport: It is stated here that the snakes who live in the planetary system, known as Mahatala, are very powerful and have many hoods. They live with their wives and children and consider themselves very happy. although they are always full of anxiety because of garuda who comes there to destroy them this is the way of material life even if one lives in the most abominable condition he still thinks himself happy with his wife children friends and family so thank you for this opportunity to speak on the bhagavatam today so today i'll quickly recap what is going on and then I'll focus on the theme which I wanted to discuss. We'll see here three verses we discuss from the Bhagavatam, and this this section is said to be called the Brahmanda Varnan section, the description of the universe. And yet, what do we see among these three verses? The first is not really about Brahmanda. The first verse is about one particular special person living at a particular place in the Brahmanda. That is in Sutal. Bali Maharaj is living, and how glorious that Bali Maharaj is, that is described. So then, that that so it is the character, and not just the character in general, specifically the devotional character of that character. 
So character can refer to a person. Character can also refer to their personality, their nature. So that verse describes that. The next verse gives some description. Okay, below the sutal is then talatal, mahatal, like that. There's some description of the cosmos. But then immediately after that, it's not just a description of the universe per se. It is a description of people living in the universe, and not just of people living in the universe, of the conceptions of those people. So it describes that there. Um, so the second verse had some cosmological description, but then there is a description of Maya Dana who has this not his conception but misconception that because Lord Shiva protects me, I needn't fear the Surya Chakra. So the Bhagavatam is quite objective that this conception this person has and his conception is wrong. And then this this verse. Describes how there are these various snakes living, and the snakes live in fear of Garuda, and yet they are happy with their materialistic life. So again, there is not much geographical description of the place, of how big it is. Okay, what are its dimensions? And now, not so much of all that. That is there, but that is not the primary focus. So, so here also, if you see. What they're saying, Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada is not going too much into the cosmology. Okay, this is here, this is here, this is here. Prabhupada is focusing on the principle. The principle that is operational throughout the universe. And what is that principle? That, that we may be in dangerous or distressful conditions. Still, what happens is, if we have some little pleasure, we start enjoying that. And forget our overall precarious condition, and that is a consistent theme of the Bhagavatam and of philosophy of scriptural philosophy teachings in general. That we this world is dukhalaya, but we tend to forget that because of Maya. So the the three verses and Shri Prabhupada's purport indicate something that the Bhagavatam's focus. Is not on cosmology; it is on consciousness. The Bhagavatam's focus, even when it is describing cosmology, it is describing the consciousness of the various people living living in different people places in the cosmos. So, just to uh, draw contrast here, if we have, uh, if we have a book of geography. Mm -hmm. Then, generally speaking, that book will tell, okay, you know, India is a tropical country, or say, uh, the Siberia is in the temperate, torrid zone part of the world, and this is the kind of vegetation that grow over here. This much is the population over there. It won't go so much into the consciousness of people. And similarly, if we had a book of cosmology, hmm? if we had a book of cosmology, say. Uh, we there are many books about the universe. They'll describe okay, this planet, you know, this is this distance away from the earth, and it's this size, this is its temperature over here. It will have mostly physical descriptions. On the other hand, say if there were a person who went on a personal tour of the world, maybe some travel journalist or some adventure travel person who is like a travel adventurer, and then they go, Oh, I went to this place, and they will describe. Not just the physical dimensions of the place; they'll describe that, but they will also describe primarily what is of interest to them. So, if that person is going to in investigate birds, they are ornithologists. They'll discuss. Okay, I found these these words over here. If that person is a, a ethologist, then that person will say, okay, these kind of animals are living over here, and this is how they live. And the animals in this part of the world live in this way. Similar animals, lions here live this way, but lions there live that way. If that person is an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. then they will describe human culture they'll say okay people in this part of the world they live like this and they wear like this they eat like this they behave like this so now the bhag so the point i'm making is whenever any person writes a book mm -hmm. uh, two things what is written in the book and who is writing the book both of these can give us an idea of what the purpose of the book is the bhagavatam is offering a tour of the cosmos the bhagavatam is written by a spiritualist that is 
or we could say the Bhagavatam is spoken. It is written by Vyasadeva ultimately, but it is spoken by Parikshit Maharaj. And what is Parikshit Maharaj's purpose? It is to elevate the consciousness of uh, it is spoken by Shukadeva Goswami and his purpose is to elevate the consciousness of Parikshit Maharaj. So, the per, so he's a spiritualist wanting to elevate consciousness to the spiritual level. And from that perspective, when he's describing the universe, what is he describing? The consciousness of characters across the universe. And his purpose is, okay, these people have this kind of consciousness. Ultimately, everybody is meant to focus on Krishna. He's the source of the universe. He's the sustainer of the universe. And he is the purpose of the universe. That's what will be described towards the end of this section. That's what also described towards the start of the section. So the, the Bhagavatam is a consciousness-centered book. Its purpose is to raise our consciousness. So when we are also studying the Bhagavatam, our purpose is to raise our consciousness to the study, study, through the study of the Bhagavatam. And then, when we are talking about this particular purpose of raising our consciousness, now what does it mean, literally, raise our consciousness? Is the consciousness like a physical object? Like I have a phone over here. And now I raise the phone up. I literally pick it up. So is, is our consciousness like a physical object to be picked up? What does raising it mean? Actually, when we talk about consciousness what and raising it, what it means is that what is the primary level at which our consciousness functions? That means, or what is the where does our consciousness regularly reside and act? For some people, it may be at the level of food. If you consider newborn babies, they are in Annamai Kosh. For them, the whole universe is potential food. Everything they get, they'll go into their mouth. They experience the world through their tongue and mouth. So what is it? That's Annamai Kosh. So their consciousness is at the level of food. Some people may grow up biologically, but they may not evolve in terms of koshas. So they may still, their consciousness is primarily at the level of food. For some other people, their consciousness may be primarily at the level of money. Mm -hmm. For others, their consciousness may be at the level of something like the family. Now, okay, I want money, I want food, but I, ultimately I want to take care of my family. So we can say each of these is slightly higher. And then somebody may think about their country, somebody may think about their about humanity, somebody may think about the environment. So each of these indicates the consciousness is rising, rising. So when we start thinking of realities bigger than ourselves, bigger than ourselves and bigger than our immediate cravings. That is when our consciousness starts rising. So raising of consciousness doesn't mean just thinking of a higher reality. Somebody may think about God when they go to a temple and they pray to God. But when they, even when they're praying to God, actually they, are, they may temporarily raise their consciousness, but basically they're calling the higher reality to change the lower reality. They are not praying to raise their consciousness per se. But to raising our consciousness means we understand Krishna is the defining reality of my life. Let me focus on serving Krishna and he will give me the guidance how to deal with the various challenges that come in my life. Mat chittaha sarva durgani mat prasada tarishasi. As Krishna says in 1858 in the Gita. So, to raise our consciousness means our default level of consciousness is Krishna. Another way to understand this is what is the level of our consciousness to understand it is that we can, we can do some self-observation. What do we think of when we have nothing to think of? Now, when we are not doing some job, maybe we are not doing something tangible, not, we don't have anything immediately to do. What do we do at that time? What do we think of when we have nothing to think of. That is a fair indicator of where our consciousness is. So if somebody, when they have nothing to think about, they immediately start thinking about Krishna, maybe something they heard about him, they start chanting his names, they start picking up Bhagavatam and reading, start dwelling on him. So that indicates that that is the level of our consciousness. So the purpose of the Bhagavatam is to raise Parikshit Maharaj's consciousness and to raise everyone's consciousness towards Krishna. And everything that is told in the Bhagavatam 
is for that purpose. Now, uh, the level of our consciousness is very closely related with our faith. The level of consciousness is related with our faith. Why is that? Because if somebody's consciousness at the level of food, Anna Maikosh, they think that food is the primary source of pleasure, not just sustenance, but pleasure. They have that faith. If I have food, I'll be happy. If I don't have food, if I don't have delicious food, I'm going to be miserable and I don't want to be miserable. If somebody is constantly thinking about money, that indicates that their faith is in money. So, uh, the Shraddha is very, very closely related with Chetana. So, generally, where our Shraddha is, that is where our Chetana will be. So, when we have to raise our consciousness toward Krishna, what does it mean? Our, our Shraddha has to increase in Krishna. The more we have faith in Krishna, naturally, we will think about him. That doesn't mean we will not, uh, say if somebody is sick, that doesn't mean we will think about a doctor or we don't think we will think about uh, emergency care or health insurance. We will think about that. But we will see all that as our way of doing our part in Krishna's service. So, that's why faith is important. Now, when we study the Bhagavatam, if these two points are the background, first is, that uh, first point I made is, the whole Bhagavatam's purpose, even in describing the cosmology, is to talk about consciousness and to raise consciousness. And the level of our consciousness depends on the object of our faith. So to raise our consciousness, we need to raise our faith. We need to raise the object in which we have faith. So let's see how we can do that by considering faith and its objects. So this is the broad topic I'll be discussing and faith, understanding faith through its objects and its levels. So objects of faith. For us, ultimately, the object of faith is Krishna. Now, Krishna is the central object of faith. Now, we can say that for us, our faith in Krishna develops through our Diksha Guru. So, yes, Prasad, Bhagavad Prasad. But then for most of us, our Diksha Guru may not be very accessible. So most of our practical guidance and practical, even devotional, devotional wisdom, we may learn from our Shiksha Gurus. So that is, so our faith in Diksha Guru will take us toward Krishna. Our faith in Shiksha Guru will take us toward Krishna. Now, when we are doing services, it's not that our Shiksha Guru will always be involved. We may have managerial authorities. Then we have various devotees in the devotee community. Then for specific things, we may have specific guides. So now, in our journey toward Krishna, to some extent, when we are interacting with our Shiksha Guru, with our managerial authorities, there is some level of faith required. But is it that our faith in all these needs to be equal and equally strong? No, not necessarily. Now, I may have strong faith in my Shiksha Guru, but I may not have that same level of faith in my immediate managerial authority. And that's okay. Faith is not, cannot be mandated. It is individual. It is relational. So to in fact expect or demand that we have the same level of faith in everyone. That is actually a form, form of Mayavad. Because essentially Mayavad is not just the rejection of God as a person. Mayavad is a rejection of variety. Mayavad is a Th that all variety is an illusion. But different people are different. So their approach to Krishna consciousness is different. Our approach may be a particular way. We are individuals. They are individuals. So even when different devotees give classes, our faith in different devotees will be at different levels. So even different Shiksha Gurus, we may have different levels of faith. And that is fine. Ultimately, whatever be the level of our faith in different, ob different particular objects, so in, in a particular Shiksha Guru, we may have a lot of faith. Now the Shiksha Guru, okay, I have faith in their understanding of philosophy, in their answering philosophical questions, but their practical guidance, maybe, you know, sometimes they're not that connected with the world. So that's fine. So what happens is, ultimately we want to go toward Krishna. So all these are objects of faith. We can't have the same level of faith in all these objects. Our, 
अब द पॉइंट इज दैट फ्रॉम ऑल सॉरी ओके वेयर इज दिस नाउ so from all these various objects of faith ultimately we want to come to faith in krishna and we want our faith in krishna to be the strongest so so what happens over here is we know in our shastras also there is a description of levels of devotees and now we may say if i don't have faith in a particular devotee is that my problem or is their problem well let's not talk in terms of problem let's talk in terms of levels so if somebody is a uttam adhikari then what happens is they infuse faith within others by both their scriptural knowledge and their devotional purity they have they have a deep and vast level of knowledge and also they they have no interest other than to glorify krishna prabhupada simply loved krishna and wanted the whole world to love krishna so that inspired faith in krishna among people who had never even heard of krishna before that is the capacity of uttam adhikari now if you consider madhyam adhikari madhyam adhikari may also strengthen our faith but the madhyam adhikari may not have that level of devotional purity but madhyam adhikari will have scriptural knowledge yes they can answer questions they can be analytical they can they can discuss various technicalities and they can help us uh, develop faith from that perspective now if somebody is a kanishtha they may lack devotional purity and they may even lack scriptural knowledge and what may happen is the way they deal the way they answer questions what may happen by that is they may damage our faith they may even destroy someone's faith now sometimes among the devotee community uh, some devotees say oh, i brought so many people to krishna through my preaching 20 people came through my people 100 people came through my pe- preaching 100 people came well okay from a from a statistical perspective just to keep some track we can consider that way but everybody spiritual journey is a long multi life journey and we just happened to be at the door through which they walked in maybe we, we held their hand and brought them in so they have their journey toward krishna and we just happen to be guide at one level so it's not really f- uh, pro- accurate to say that we brought them to krishna but even if from a functional perspective we do that you know and we may keep track of that but how many of us keep track of how many people went away from krishna because of us you know we won't want to think about that because you know we don't want people to go away from krishna and certainly we don't want to be responsible for that but who knows sometimes the way we answered questions sometimes the way we behaved sometimes the way we maybe we were angry or arrogant or, or abrasive or whatever we may have alienated people from krishna so what happens is that we can sometimes be a source of faith and we can sometimes be a source of uh, loss of faith or damage to faith and the same can apply to others so now why am, we are discussing the bhagavatam and why am i discussing about devotees and devotees the levels of devotees no our point is that point is we are discussing consciousness and how the consciousness evolves so just as in interacting with different devotees our consciousness may evolve or it may devolve or in some con- some devo- interacting with uttama devotee our consciousness may rise rapidly With, in interacting with the kanishtha devotee it may rise gradually or it may descend also so just as our con- the, depending on the object with which our consciousness is interacting and depending on the shraddha we have in that object consciousness can move up and down now the same principle can apply to scriptural study so now in some ways what happens is the way the world is designed it shakes us to wake us so shake to wake prabhupada says that the distresses of the material world are ultimately meant to remind us of our incompatibility with matter that this material body and this material world gives us so much distress it reminds us that oh don't turn to, don't turn away from krishna turn toward krishna so shake to wake that that's the purpose of all the things that shake us so in fact it's not just a journey of life our entire journey whether it is the study of scripture or whether it is the study study of the spiritual path 
it is meant to bring us to our centering our faith on krishna alone so now the example for this is draupadi what happened to draupadi she was in the asat sabhaya and she had five powerful husbands she was in the presence of illustrious guru elders and actually if we try to visualize the situation she's just been dragged by the hair now such an idea itself is unconscionable draupadi is a royal princess the daughter of one of the most powerful kings at that time and she is the wife of five powerful heroes now nobody would even dare to glance at her to stare at her in an inappropriate way what to speak of her touch her or touch her roughly and what to speak of drag her by the hair she has been dragged in she just come normally to visit her relatives her, her husband's cousins and suddenly she is dragged out of the ladies chamber chambers she is brought there in the, in the public assembly she is just wearing a single cloth and at that time she sees that her powerful husbands who are meant to protect her they are all silent and now she is a kshatrayani so she is not a person who will just crumble into tears oh why is this happening to me no she may have a frail body but she has a spine of steel and with that spine of steel she immediately assesses the situation and what does she do she at one when she is she understands what has happened when dushasan while dragging her tells her that you have been lost in the gambling match which yudhishthir played with duryodhana through shakuni and now you are the maid servant you are the slave of the kauravas she's aghast but she doesn't panic and collapse she immediately starts thinking and when she comes to the palace she is disappointed no doubt that yudhishthir gambled like this she feels betrayed that none of the pandavas are rising to protect her now draupadi is surrounded by people over there and yet she is utterly alone utterly completely alone there are there are different degrees of loneliness sometimes we be alone because there is nobody around us and that is bad especially if we are not used to solitude we want to someone to talk with but just physical loneliness is not as bad is not as hurtful as being surrounded by people who don't support us so we are making a point and then we say if there is a managerial meeting going on and we raise some objection and everybody remains deathly silent nobody speaks in support of what we are saying we may be surrounded by people but we will feel alone but there all that is going to happen is a proposal that we made is going to be shot down but here for draupadi her very honor is at stake and she sees her husbands they are silent she feels betrayed but she doesn't dwell on that betrayal she feels angry and she she her, her glances of anger they incense the kaur pandavas but bhima is restrained by arjuna don't, don't do this we have given our word but then what does she do she tries to reason with the kauravas she tries to explain and analyze the principles of dharma that doesn't work and then she turns to krishna and she surrenders to krishna raising her hands in helplessness oh keshava oh govinda i am sinking into this ocean of the kauravas please become my canoe and save me and she calls out with fervency and krishna appears krishna appears and saves her so draupadi's past time this past time what is it meant to indicate that ultimately we are meant to center our faith in krishna alone the, the pandavas were not just our husbands they were great devotees but sometimes the world may bring us to a situation where even devotees may not understand us and at that time our faith has to be centered on krishna 
when prabhupad came to america he was a part of the gaudiya vaishnav tradition he was a disciple of that glorious guru who had spread the gaudiya math all over the world and he's in that sense prabhupad was a part of the gaudiya math prabhupad when he went to america he never thought i am going to go and start another organization which will be separate from the gaudiya math he saw it as starting another branch of the gaudiya math itself but nobody from the gaudiya math helped him he was not asking them for money he was not asking them for people he was simply asking them that the i have a donor in india and the donor is ready to send funds here you just please talk with the indian government one of his god brothers had had many had many interactions with the president of india rajendra prasad at that time so prabhupad wrote to him you just put a word to him that i the, the, the president was also a spiritually minded person he had written several spiritual books so tell him that i am sharing, sharing spreading the spiritual message of the bhagavatam in fact that president of india had also written a positive review of prabhupad's bhagavatam so he said just tell him that i am doing this and please get him to uh, approve the sending of the foreign exchange his god brother didn't do at all he didn't even raise a finger to help him so prabhupad felt alone but what happened was he centered his faith on krishna alone and then he turned to krishna na chao na chao prabhu na chao samate krishna how do you want me to make how do you want me to dance and then prabhupad started getting help from people in the west and that is how the movement spread so the point i am making is this can happen in life and this can happen in our study of scripture also there are certain things in life which may shake our faith and then we will have a choice oh this devotee acted in such an outrageous way you know devotees behave like this why should i stay connected with krishna and so when that faith is shaken we can go away and we can give up krishna itself because of that or when some devotee is acting in a way that shakes our faith can say okay that this devotee may have helped me in my spiritual journey but ultimately my faith is meant to be in krishna not in this devotee it was krishna who was guiding me through this devotee this devotee when this devotee was acting properly now if this devotee is not acting properly that means i am not seeing krishna through this devotee so let me see how i can see krishna through whom i can get guidance and let me keep moving toward krishna so just as in our life things may shake us events may shake us and then we will have to choose do i go away from krishna or do i go toward krishna so similarly during the study of our scripture also things may shake us and that is the time we will have to choose do i go inward toward krishna or do i give up and go away from krishna let's try to understand this now so if i consider if we consider the object of faith is the bhagavatam now the bhagavatam is centered on krishna lila and krishna lila is described most in the 10th canto oh. our acharyas some of our acharyas have commented on all the cantos of the bhagavatam but far more acharyas have commented on the 10th canto they have retold the 10th canto like the gopal champu and anand naun champu they have verse by verse commented on the 10th canto like shri chakravarti and vishnu chakravarti they have elaborated on the 10th canto the specific the rasa panchadhyay as in the lalita madhav and vidagda madhav chamatkar chandrika and other books so the 10th canto is the heart of the bhagavatam and in the bhagavatam there are many different pastimes so there is vamshavali vamshavali means the list of the dynasties okay this will instead was here and this king from this king this king king there from this king this king came in the 8th 9th cantos there are several chapters describing this list of kings that's a part of the bhagavatam but is that a important part no do we need to memorize it all do we need to memorize every single name and we are okay you know this is all describing literal history and do we need so do we need to have do we need to give equal amount of attention do we need to say just as we want to remember krishna and we may memorize verses about krishna do we need to memorize verses about every single section of the bhagavatam do we need to think constantly about every section of the bhagavatam always remember krishna now does that mean that we have to remember the second canto description of the virat rupa 
memorize those verses? Does that mean that the third canto description of Sankhya or the fifth canto description of Brahmanda? Now there is a lot of avatar lila. Avatar lila means various avatars are described and their pastime is Vamana Dev, Varaha Dev, and so many other avatars. And there is there is Prahlad lila, there is Dhruva lila. These are all described. So they are all they are all can be objects of study. They can all be objects of contemplation. But the Bhagavatam's point is, from all of these, we move toward Krishna. We focus our consciousness on Krishna. So sometimes, some of the things we hear, they may make immediate sense for us. Oh, this is so profound. This is so illuminating. And this has increased my conviction to practice bhakti so much. So let me do that immediately. Let me do it strongly, forcefully. But sometimes what may happen is that, yeah. So, so sometimes we may hear Prahlad's pastime, like just now Narasana Chaturdashi happened. And when you hear Prahlad's pastime, just seeing his faith, his devotion, the Lord's protection, the sweet interactions between Prahlad and Narasimha, that may increase our faith. I also want to become a strong, determined, faithful devotee. So what will happen is from there, the journey to Krishna will, sorry, sorry for us, the journey to Krishna will be much easier, faster. On the other hand, if we read the Sankhya section, there's so much technical description over there. It's valuable for those who have an interest in analytical, phys analytical physics. They may find it very interesting. But do we need to pay the same amount of time and attention? And do we need to memorize the verses describing the characteristics of water and air and sound and things like that? Well, if we have the capacity, why not? But do we need to? Not necessarily. The point of the Sankhya description is to get us toward Krishna. The point of similarly the Brahmanda Varanan is to get us toward Krishna. To get us toward Krishna. So now, some things in the description of the Brahmanda may make sense to us immediately. And some things may not make sense to us. And in fact, some things may completely challenge our sense of what is, what is rational, what is acceptable. And then what do we do? So that is like, okay, do we, because I can't make sense of this, so I can't, I won't study the Bhagavatam itself. I'll, I will reject the Bhagavatam. I'll reject Krishna Bhakti itself. So then what is happening? We are falling outwards. So when our faith is challenged, we can fall outward or we can move inward. Okay, what is the point of the Brahmanda description? It is to talk about consciousness, elevating consciousness and resting the consciousness ultimately in Krishna. So let me focus on Krishna. I respect the, so just like if some devotee behaves in a way that is disagreeable, disruptive to our faith, we may still respect that devotee. But what we will do is, we will move onward toward Krishna. Now we are not comparing a section of the Bhagavatam with a devotee who is having some ethical problems or who is behaving improperly. The, the point is not to come, equate the two. The point is to consider the principle that we are on a journey toward Krishna. So, in fact, Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that in his uh, Chaitanya Shikshamrata and Krishna Samhita, at various places, he indicates that the purpose of the fifth canto is to take us toward, to test us on our way toward Krishna. Are we so interested in Krishna that we are ready to put aside our prejudices and preconceptions? Okay, this doesn't make sense. But this is not the point over here. Let me move toward Krishna. So this is not the most important thing. And even if this doesn't make sense, let me suspend judgment for now. Not that I reject it. I can't accept it, but that doesn't mean I have to reject it. Let me suspend judgment. And let me move toward Krishna. So for so this is, this is the, the point of our faith, uh, the journey of our consciousness, the point of our faith is ultimately Krishna. So now somebody may say, I know I can't understand these things. And somebody else may say that, how do you not accept it? Don't you have faith in scripture? Now, if you don't have faith in scripture, you're going to go to hell. So what happened is, is faith, what somebody may call as faith, that may actually not be faith, that may be intellectual arrogance. That intellectual arrogance means this is the only reality. And if you don't accept this reality, you're going to go to hell. You are not a devotee, you are a doubter and you are condemned. So this kind of judgmental attitude 
it may seem like somebody having strong faith and expecting others to have strong faith but it may just be their own arrogance you know i am right and you are wrong i am virtuous and you are not just see how much shraddha i have and how great i am just see how little shraddha you have and how terrible you are so this is basically power play masquerading as faith that i want a sense of superiority over others so i use i different people may play the different cards you know like in in certain countries say in america people may some people play the race card in india some people may the, play the caste card oh i am from a lower caste that's why people are doing all this to me and you try to gain sympathy by that so so some people may play the faith card that oh i have so much faith and you don't have any faith at all well the point is not who has faith and who does not have faith the point is how can we move toward krishna and how can we help others to move toward krishna so faith in what somebody may call as faith in scripture may well be intellectual arrogance so if somebody says no the bhagavatam's description is literally true and all that science is self told that is all nonsense hmm? okay then we ask this a few critical questions about that okay then how does this work how does this work you know you know you are maya parita gyana your knowledge and intelligence has been knowledge is stolen by maya now that is just a way to dodge all questions to, to dodge difficult questions so what happens is if we have true if we truly have faith in something and if we want others to have faith in that then we need to be able to explain that if we can't explain something and then we demand faith in others then that is basically a call to blind faith and that is never the mood of scripture krishna himself is god or krishna is god himself and yet nowhere in the gita does krishna tell arjuna because i am god you must obey me and fight krishna reasons with arjuna analyzes various paths the effects of on the consciousness that they have how they will lead either to bondage or liberation and then makes a case to arjuna so even krishna does not call for blind faith krishna what he offers is he explains reasonably and then he calls for devotional surrender so faith in scripture should not be intellectual arrogance faith in scripture means that we have devotional confidence that okay the fifth canto cosmology i don't understand it so well but we understand they are a vision of reality they are seen from a higher perspective they are seen by the devtas they are seen by the sages this is how the cosmos is envisioned uh, when a person is a particular state of consciousness but the point of this is this is a vision of reality that can connect us to the ultimate reality krishna the point is they see the universe in this way and from this vision how can they move toward krishna they are moving toward krishna this way and let us also move to, move toward krishna either by this way or by some other way so when faith leads to intellectual arrogance and condemnation of others that's actually not faith that's pseudo faith that's just power play that's just ego masquerading as faith so now when i said devotional confidence how can we have that devotional confidence we understand that there is a gross physical domain and then there is a spiritual domain in between that there is a subtle domain so in the bhagavatam commentary the acharya has explained that we humans have been given a particular vision of the universe that like the the surya and chandra the sun and moon are far away from us we can see them but within the universe the the meru parvat which is said to be like the central pivot of the universe that is relatively close to us but we can't see it why is that because the bhagavatams bhagavatam the commentators describe that we humans are finite beings we have finite level of good karma and therefore we are given eyes to see those things which are necessary for the evolution of our consciousness so seeing certain celestial bodies which are relevant for astrological cal- calculations which help us to decide the shubha muhurtas they can help us to act in a way that our consciousness rises and we create a auspicious future for ourselves so we are not given access to the whole universe 
and that is by design it's just like if somebody is working in a big computer big computer company now if that that person is a clerk they will have access to certain folders and if they click on other folders they, you don't have access to that so now similarly within the universe there are many many levels of reality and we have access to some so and we don't have access to many so for the many levels of reality that we don't have access to how do we approach them so that is the subtle domain so the you know brahma's body is said to be made of intelligence now intelligence itself is a subtle object so what do we mean by a body of intelligence so it's all subtle so one approach to the subtle domain would be that that although i can't understand it i insist that all its concepts all the resulting perspectives and all the powers are literally true mm-hmm. now if it is subtle how is it literal literal means something which you can practically physically see but now this is the only way this is the only way this is the this is the exclusive attitude the other is oh you know this whole subtle domain is unbelievable irrational i reject it so the more balanced approach is that we accept that a subtle domain exists and a subtle domain is extremely complex it has enormous potentiality but our focus is on how that subtle domain can connect us with krishna how the vision in the sort of subtle domain can connect us with krishna that is the purpose of studying the subtle domain if say this is the physical domain this is spiritual domain this is where krishna as a person primarily exists krishna in one sense pervades all of existence but krishna performs his leela in the spiritual domain so our purpose is to raise our consciousness from the physical level to the spiritual level now in the subtle level there may be many things so which of these things are obstructing us in our journey toward krishna which of the things are can help us in our journey toward krishna based on that anukulya se sankalpa pratikulya se varjana we don't make a judgment about the various things in the subtle domain as there may be a lot of complex realities over here but what is it that is favorable for me what is it that will help me in moving toward krishna we focus on that so now with this understanding of the bhagavatam's devotional purpose let's see what the bhagavatam is doing in the fifth canto cosmology the purpose is that the cosmology that is described in the bhagavatam is in many ways not unique to the bhagavatam similar descriptions of the cosmos come in the other puranas also some minor variations are there but major there are similarities so that was the cosmology that was known to parikshit maharaj but the point is it was just cosmological knowledge parikshit maharaj is being helped by shukdev goswami to see spirituality in cosmology there are two ways to think about krishna forget everything that we know and just think of krishna the other is what we already know how can we see krishna in that how can we connect krishna with that both are both are valid one we could call it intensive spirituality that or exclusive spirituality just focus on krishna and the other is inclusive spirituality right how can i use what i know in the service of krishna say somebody before coming to bhakti had learned some musical instrument so somebody has learned violin and one way to think of krishna is oh all this mundane musical knowledge is maya leave it and think of krishna the other is okay you have a violin you know how to use a violin how can you use the you use the violin to to produce music that is centered on krishna so the point is what is already familiar to us we can use that also to focus on krishna to connect with krishna so that is parikshit maharaj situation to some extent the cosmology is already familiar to him not entirely but to some extent so shukdev was swami showing him how to see krishna within that cosmology but now in our situ- just to come to this point in our situation that cosmology is unfamiliar to us so now do we need to learn all that cosmology and then we see krishna in that well if you have the interest wonderful if not okay we lead to the cosmology understand how their characters are seeing krishna in within the description of the cosmos and move on 
So it's not that say everybody has to learn violin so that they can use violin in serving Krishna. No, if you already studied that, wonderful. If you already have that skill, good. Not studied, have that skill, good. So same with the Bhagavatam's cosmology. The point is that if it is anukul for our for our focus on Krishna, great. If it is not anukul, if trying to understand this is challenging us intellectually so much, exhausting us intellectually so much that we just can't think of Krishna, then respectfully move on. I am not at the intellectual level. I don't have the cultural familiarity. You know, I don't, I just can't understand this. It, it is in the Bhagavatam. It is given in scripture. So it is describing a level of reality. At the same time, my purpose is not to understand all of material reality in its complexity. My purpose is to focus on the supreme spiritual reality, Krishna. So if this description of material reality is too complex for me to comprehend, then I respectfully move on. So then we talk about Shastriya Shraddha. So you may say that this is going Shastra. Shouldn't we have Shraddha in it? Yes, of course. But what does Shastriya Shraddha mean? It actually means not just faith in Shastra, but faith in the ultimate purpose of Shastra. Vedaishya Sarvair Ameva Vedyo, as Krishna says in 15.15, that the ultimate purpose of everything in the scripture is to help us come toward Krishna, to know Krishna, to love Krishna. And what does it mean that we, Shastri Shraddha also means that every aspect of Shastra is ultimately meant to take us toward Krishna. So some aspects of scripture, we'll be able to see how this takes us toward Krishna. Some, we will not be able to see how it takes us toward Krishna. So if some aspects are not helping us move toward Krishna, we try to take guidance from our, our mothers to see how this is connected with Krishna. If it's still difficult, then we focus on the purpose. That is, we move toward Krishna. So the point is, if you talk about Shastri Shaddha, this is given Shastra, so we have to accept it. But the Bhagavatam itself gives an example of Narad Muni who reproaches Vyasa Dev. He says, you have written so many Shastras, but these Shastras may not take people toward Krishna. And therefore he says, you write something that will take people directly toward Krishna. So even Sh Shastri Shaddha doesn't mean that one accepts everything that is in Shastra if it is not taking people toward Krishna. But then, so now that's what Narad Muni is chiding Vyasa Dev for. But then we may say, is this is the Bhagavatam. Isn't everything in the Bhagavatam taking us toward Krishna? Yes, it is meant to. But again, context is important. In the Bhagavatam itself, we may say that the object of all faith, Krishna is speaking. And Krishna in the Govardhan Lila speaks Karma Mimamsa. Krishna says there is no need for any higher sanction. You just work and you'll get the rewards. And Krishna is speaking this. So the, the Acharya tell us this is Karma Mimamsa. We don't have to take it seriously. So it is in the Bhagavatam. It is being spoken. It is in Bhagavatam, which is Amala Purana. And it is spoken by Krishna, who is the Paratpara Tattva, who is the Ashirai Tattva. All the other Bhagavatam points are Ashrit Tattva. The supreme shelter. The supreme shelter in the supremely pure scripture is speaking. And our Acharya say, move on. Our Acharya say, move on. Why? Because context is important. In that context, Krishna's purpose was not to tell an ultimate philosophical truth. Krishna's purpose was to test and incite Indra so that his pride would be exposed and eventually he'll be freed from the pride. So, we don't, abs we don't see that between there is absolutizing every scripture statement and relativizing every scripture statement. Between the two extremes of absolutizing and relativizing is contextualizing. We understand the context in which something is spoken. And by that understanding of context, we see what is the point over here and we focus on that point. So, the Bhagavatam's purpose is to devotionally retell themes that are told in other Shastras. So, those who are attracted toward those Shastras will become attracted toward the Bhagavatam. Oh, the story which I know is told over here also. I want to know the story. But then hey, the story has a different conclusion. This has a different point over here. Oh, okay. 
let me see what this is and in that way they will come toward krishna so for example all the three things you are described over here, we discussed in the past time bali maharaj is encounter with ravan and vaman dev that is described in the puranas the story of garuda persecuting the garuda attacking the snakes that's elaborately described in the mahabharat the story of maidana and lord shiva that is described elaborately in the shiva puranas so st- stories which are already familiar to the bhagavatam's audience the bhagavatam is retelling them from a devotional perspective and the point is to take people's consciousness toward krishna and so so that is the purpose of the description of the bhagavatam everything in the bhagavatam including the cosmos so for us we understand that the cosmos purpose is to take our consciousness toward krishna and we see how our consciousness can best move toward krishna and act accordingly and that is the way we can be vyavasayatmika buddhi ekeh kurunandana bahu shakha anantascha vyavas buddhayo avyavasayina when studying the bhagavatam when we are fixed on krishna then we will see the connection of everything with krishna otherwise we will be studying the bhagavatam but bahu shakha anantascha why oh, can't understand this i can't accept this this is so, this is unbelievable this is mythological this is this we will we will buddhayo avyavasayina we will be lost so prabhupad was expert in even the technical sections of the bhagavatam his commentaries don't get too technical his commentaries focus on the principles of spiritual life how to live in a way that we can raise our consciousness so prabhupad was vyavasayatmika buddhi ekeh kurunandana and similarly following prabhupad we can also be one pointed in in our intelligence in our determination focus on krishna and then the bhagavatam will be rich with resources for us to progress toward krishna some of those resources will be especially potent for us some of those resources may not be so relevant for us we accept those resources which are potent for us and march on steadily toward krishna and thus the bhagavatam will ensure that it makes our life successful that krishna manifests in our heart rudya avrodhati krishna will manifest in our hearts and tapatraya unmulanam will become free from the distresses of material existence and we will attain krishna's abode so i'll summarize what i spoke today broadly i spoke five points first point i spoke was that we did a quick overview of what is spoken in the bhagavatam and bhagavatam is consciousness centered even when describing cosmology the bhagavatam's purpose is to raise our consciousness from wherever it is towards krishna and to raise our consciousness our object of faith has to become bigger and higher and when then we talked about the second point was how when we talk about the object of faith ultimate object of faith is krishna and around krishna there are many different objects and in all those objects we may have different levels of faith so in the diksha guru shiksha guru in the temp- in the managerial authorities in the devotees in general we may have different levels of faith but our point is that through all these we move toward krishna and it's un- it's natural that say different devotees we may have different levels of faith because kanishta madhyam and uttam are different in terms of the effect that they have on us similarly if you consider the bhagavatam to be like a big circle the purpose of the bhagavatam is to vishnu smaranam ante narayana smriti to remember the supreme lord and he is most directly and vividly described in the 10th canto so everything in the bhagavatam is meant to enhance the remembrance of krishna so around krishna the various objects that are there we may not have the same level of faith in those objects but still we can move toward krishna in that connection i talked about how the approach of a devotee is to not reject the subtle domain not fully insist the subtle domain everything is true we understand the subtle is complex so in that complexity what is relevant for me i use it to move toward krishna so why is the bhagavatam describing the cos- cosmology because what is already familiar to shubh parikshit maharaj in terms of cosmological knowledge bhagavatam is enabling him to see krishna in that so 
for us if the cosmology is not familiar it's not cosmo comprehensible then let's not waste too much intellectual energy on that let's focus on the purpose of that description and as prabhupad does we move toward krishna there why so shastriya shraddha doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have the equal level of faith in each statement of shastra no we understand the purpose of shastra we see the various sections of scripture in relationship with that purpose and we pursue that purpose of shastra which is to take us towards krishna and the most dramatic example of this shastri shraddha is that in the amala puran the paramashraya in the dasham skanda is speaking and acharya say that this is not the truth why because karma mimamsa spoken by krishna and govardhanila is not going to take us towards krishna so that is the vyavsayatmak buddhi which even the acharyas are demonstrating shastra and that is what we apply when we study the various domains of the subtle description subtle dom- description of subtle domain like the cosmos if we understand it if that inspires us to remember krishna wonderful if not we see that is one resource and the bhagavatam offers many other resources for me to enrich my devotion and enhance my remembrance of krishna let me take those resources that help nourish me the most and move onward in my journey toward krishna thank you very much hare krishna so hare is krishna prabhu is there any quick are there any quick questions thank you so much for wonderful wonderful class prabhu and also summarizing am i audible prabhu or no yes mata ji you are audible thank you so much for wonderful wonderful class prabhu and uh, giving so many examples uh, draupadi also when she has got uh, all the his five um, powerful husbands but still she was helpless and she um actually depended on krishna i think like like that whenever we have things we just depend okay, on krishna and how our consciousness yes i let go be mata ji um hari krishna prabhu ji thank you prabhu ji for the class uh, prabhu ji i had a question so when you said you know uh, like i i want to connect are fifth canto to I'm not, sorry i'm not able to hear yeah um yes prabhu we are speaking i think you are unable to hear us prabhu yeah can you speak now okay uh, prabhu ji am i audible yes it's clear okay. sorry yeah so now uh, you know this fifth canto of the shrimad bhagavatam all i know that you know the the person i am uh, trying to love i mean uh, whatever that revival of that uh, love is very intelligent and i am very grateful to him this is what i i usually you know i see fifth canto that you know oh he is so intelligent is that sufficiently bringing me my uh, my level up or is it um, Uh, do i need to put in some uh, some more thought and you know i feel he's super intelligent he's he is uh, he's so precise he's so nice that you know i do i i mean i see with my compare against myself i am so small i feel in front of him does that bring me to a, a, a higher a spiritual understanding or a higher spiritual domain that you said is it raising my consciousness when i just feel gratitude and feel that you know he is one of the opulence i can feel that that's, that's to some extent that's perfect see anukul oh. anukulya sa sankalpa can work in many different ways yeah. sometimes there can be appreciation without necessarily comprehension okay that means so like we, we may see some magnificent architecture of a building now we don't know how it was constructed but we appreciate that it is magnificent so similarly yeah. we may appreciate that the bhagavatam is a magnificent book of uh, wisdom now i don't appreciate all the wisdom but appreciation without comprehension can also be a favorable in the emotion on our devotional journey that's fine yeah so uh, can you just elaborate how do devotees uh, bring their consciousness higher without understanding the fifth canto can you elaborate a bit more on that okay so the point is that there are different resources just like let's put the bhagavatam aside for the time being and look at our daily devotional life so when we go to a temple there are the deities there are the kirtans there are the classes maybe there is the kitchen there are, there is some cooking seva there is some maybe garland making seva now all these are means by which we can connect with krishna we can serve krishna and we can grow spiritually so just as a temple and a devotee community offer various resources 
and we take those resources which help us move toward krishna now of course everybody is should hear the bhagavatam class but not everybody will necessarily get the same level of nourishment from the bhagavatam class some devotees may go for look forward to the kirtan when they go to class some devotees may look forward oh i want to, i want to go on the altar and serve the deities some devotees may look forward to the class so so it krishna has a personal relationship with each one of us and when somebody feels especially attracted to deities and somebody feels especially attracted to the bhagavatam it is not just their personal fickle mind saying that it could be but because it's in relationship with krishna it is krishna manifesting a spark of his vibhuti his opulence and attracting them so similarly for us the bhagavatam it's every canto it's every pastime it's every verse we can say is a resource for remembering krishna so uh, now if one particular aspect we like very much you know uh, then when we use that to remember krishna and we relish that so uh, that is krishna manifesting to us and we may focus on that i remember i was in my early days of bhakti i was a senior devotee and he was memorizing he was reciting one verse from the gita patram pushpam phalam toim several times and i asked maharaj are you memorizing this verse and i i was asking you probably memorized this verse 50, 30 40 years ago he said no i am not memorizing it i am reciting it for relishing it now i thought patram pushpam is like a very basic verse but for him the verse was not just for memorizing it was relishing so i think i am thinking of various past times of krishna associated with this verse so the point is that if now there are many verses in the bhagavad gita but if that verse is what is giving that rasa giving that absorption giving that smaran then wonderful that's a resource one doesn't have to go and memorize some other verse to remember krishna that verse itself is a resource so similarly for us if the devotee is some devotees don't really connect with the bhagavatam swift canto we respect it this is one resource but this resource is not what is suitable for me just like say some devotees when they do kirtan their kirtan is not so much a participation as a performance and they will sing hare krishna in such a complicated tune that others can only admire very few people can follow now we may also remember krishna that way oh it's a nice hare krishna tune but we can't participate in that that's fine that is a resource for them to remember krishna it's not that i have to learn kirtan singing hare krishna that way to remember krishna or to lead kirtan so what do we do is we do what is anukul for us so so that same principle applies we respect the bhagavatam this is wonderful kirtan a wonderful hare krishna singing i respect that but this is not the way i am going to do it so similarly bhagavatam fifth canto cosmology is also a resource for remembering krishna but this is not the way i am i can remember krishna so let me look at the ways i can remember krishna and focus on those ways okay yes prabhu ji yeah thank you prabhu ji hari krishna thank you रिलेशन <laughs> the relationship between the past time and conviction no it's uh, the relationship between faith and conviction okay in my understanding uh, and if you could are, also these are, these are, uh, give sorry. the references from bhagavad gita okay see these are english words now are there specific mm-hmm. sanskrit words which connect with specifically correlate with faith and conviction i'm not sure broadly speaking you can say faith is shraddha and conviction is nishtha hmm? so in the not in the bhagavad gita but in the bhakti rasamrit sindhu there is a progression described adau shraddha we begin with some faith which is like a positive curiosity okay maybe there is something in the spiritual spiritual stuff let me explore it and then when we practically practice when we when we practice and we experience the transformation then the faith becomes very strong so basically conviction is a deeper stronger level of faith Hmm. so it is when we have got some realization of it 
say for example i may say we may go to a big hospital and we may see okay there's there's so many doctors some patients over here so many doctors over here we may have faith this hospital will be a good place but if we go there and we have had a sickness for a long time and we get treated and we get cured then our faith become much stronger so that is experienced realized faith so like that shraddha can be at multiple levels so generally when we differentiate between faith and conviction we don't have to differentiate them also sometimes but if you want to differentiate faith is a little bit more preliminary conviction is a little bit more realized so shraddha is in the bhakti samrudh's uh, sindhu's nine nine steps of nine steps that are described so nishtha is considered to be much higher where we have experienced anartha nivritti like the kama krodha lobha that were that were dragging us here and there they have declined and that is how we are able to move ahead in our lives we, we are able to our faith goes into goes become stronger it goes from shraddha to nishtha okay yes bro thank you so much so there's one question yeah in the chat i'll take only one because it's related to the class that what was the point about govardhan leela and karma mimamsa okay uh, i guess i went too fast over there the let me tell, uh, in the govardhan leela krishna tells the varjavasis that actually you don't have you are doing sindra puja but there's no need to do sindra puja why because it's not indra who gives rains it is as long as you do your karma you take you you take care of the cows then nature is is obliged to give rains so krishna basically removes the role of the devatas and of higher agencies in the working of nature that to say that nature is only rule bound or law bound and there are no personal agencies involved that is the philosophy called karma mimamsa so krishna speaks karma mimamsa now is he teaching karma mimamsa in the vedanta sutra karma mimamsa is one of the philosophy that is refuted vedanta sutra is called as uttar mimamsa not karma mimamsa so that is not the vedantic conclusion at all then why is krishna teaching it or speaking it rather krishna is speaking it not as the ultimate siddhanta he is speaking it within the leela so that indra will get angry and indra's pride will come forward see sometimes what happens is that some people have anarthas but they deny the anarthas and then what happens is if we if they are put in provocative situations then their anartha comes out in such a such an ugly way that even they can't deny it is there and then they will address the problem so otherwise they will not address the problem itself so like somebody is sick and they don't accept that they are sick somebody has a sore arm they know my arm is okay I, I, okay then what we do is we give them some service like uh, carrying book crates for book distribution and then they do it one to I, i can't do it arm is paining yeah i knew your arm is paining you have to go and get some treatment so what happens is that if somebody is in denial of their problem then exposing that problem is necessary for curing that problem so indra was proud but indra was thinking i am virtuous i am the king of the gods so krishna wanted to get that pride expressed in a ugly way so that indra would realize what have i done and then he will cure it so that's how krishna incited indra by saying actually you are not in control of rains indra said, how dare i am in control of rains i will show how much i control rains i will bring the samvartha clouds over here the clouds of the universal destruction i'll bring and then what does indra try to do for one yagya not being performed indra try to destroy the entire vrindavan it's like you know one village does not give taxes to the state government and the state decides to destroy that village with nuclear weapons it's completely disproportionate and then what happens by that indra's arrogance and the resulting anger becomes very clear and then when indra is thwarted by krishna's uh, krishna is lifting the govardhan he becomes humbled so the point i'm making is that it is the absolute truth krishna speaking in the absolutely pure scripture amala puran but still what is spoken by the absolute truth in the absolutely pure scripture may not be the absolute truth 
Why? Because of context. So if somebody says, you have to have faith in every single statement in scripture, then does one have, should we have faith in the karma mimamsa as absolute truth? Absolutely not. That context is important. So my point was that if somebody says, you, know, you have to have equal faith in every statement of scripture, you have to have as much faith in the fifth canto cosmology as in the 10th canto Krishna, Krishna Leela. Well, that, where is the precedent for that in tradition? I was giving the opposite precedent and the extremely provocative opposite precedent, opposite precedent that, that context is important for determining where to, what level of faith to have and what to make as the object of our faith. Hope that is clear. Yeah, please awesome. clear. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay. Prabhu, there are some, I don't know if you, do you still have some time, Prabhu? There are some questions in the chat window right. as well, Prabhu. I'll try to take quickly one or two questions here, I'll take. Thank you, Prabhu. So, to suspend, which is not for us, but how to make ourselves understand more about the Lord. So, Jyoti Madhya is asking, that suspend judgment means that, you know, this is not what is primarily important for me. Krishna doesn't say, Anta Kale Chamameva, Brahmanda Smarane Mukti uh, ma Mameti. That is not that you remember the Brahmanda Varana and you will come to me. It says, remember me and you will come to me. Anta Kale Chamameva Smarane Mukta, not Brahmanda Eva Smarane Mukta Akaleva. So we have to see what helps us to remember Krishna. Now, how do we make ourselves more legible for understanding things? Well, by studying Shastra, by trying to become purified, by the following the standard process of bhakti. Now, by following the standard process of bhakti, is it that we will under, each one of us will understand the fifth canto cosmology better? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know what Krishna's plan is for us. If Krishna wants to make us an instrument for sharing a better understanding of the fifth canto cosmology, maybe he'll give us those insights. But otherwise, what, we, what will become better of clearer for us definitely is what is the purpose of the fifth canto cosmology and how we can serve that purpose that will become clearer that so in that sense we will be able to understand the lord better by practicing by, by practicing the process of bhakti bhaktya mam abhijanati by the practice of bhakti we'll move closer towards krishna mm. So, Hare Krishna, so, Guru Pranam, Prabhuji. Thank you so much for the explanation. I'm convinced with what you have taught us today. It was really a very good teachings. And understood many of the things that were hurdles while uh, studying BG as well as Srimad Bhagavatam. I just started uh, studying it. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we'll take the question of Surinarayan again because that's not exactly relevant right now. So thank you very much. Grantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur jai. 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 J